Hello, I am uh, Jens Alfke. I'm the mobile architect at Couchbase. I'm not the first person to work on mobile stuff here, but I, that would be Chris Anderson, but I believe I'm the second. And I'm going to be talking about some more uh, kind of a grab bag of more advanced topics with Couchbase Lite, things that if you've gone through some of our demo apps, maybe written a simple app of your own, these will be things that you are kind of ready to run into or want to understand about. Um, first, going to be talking about some more advanced querying techniques, uh, using MapReduce to do some things that are like a little bit less obvious. Uh, this actually overlaps a lot with Couchbase Server. So um, if, you've been, if you've used Couchbase Server before, used views there, you might be familiar with these. Or if you learn this with Couchbase Mobile, then if you go on to Couchbase Server, you can take advantage of that. Um, some techniques like uh, matching prefixes on strings, doing grouping, doing some kind of aggregation with grouping. And with what I call pseudo joins, where you can sort of work around the fact that we don't actually have a, a full join operation. The next thing I want to talk about is conflict resolution, uh, where, like, since this is a distributed system, if you get uh, conflicting changes made by two users, uh, how you find those, how you resolve them. And uh, if, depending on time, I'll go into some uh, performance tips, like things that you can do to make sure that your app remains fast. So let's talk about queries first. And I'll start out with uh, prefix matching. This actually came up in uh, the development of the, uh, the conference app. This is a question that I got asked last week, where they wanted uh, to be able to do uh, typing to filter the list of contacts. And so how exactly do you make that work? So here we've got a list, like kind of a hypothetical list of names. And we're going to want to match all the names that start with a particular prefix. So first, you want to normalize the string by uh, lowercasing, probably removing diacritical marks if that affects the sort. The first half of it is pretty simple. The start key in your query, where you want the start retrieving rows from, is going to be equal to the prefix. So if we want to find all the names that start with J-E-N, then the string J-E-N will be our start key. That's where we're going to start traversing the index from. The trickier part is with the end key. Like, how do you know where to stop? And the solution turns out to be, which is a slight hack, you take the prefix and you append some really high Unicode value to it. The reason for that is that a more intuitive thing might be like, well, we'll, we'll append a Z. And that works until you run into that name, Genzial, down there. And so that's not going to pick out that name. Then you say, OK, we'll put like four or five Zs on the end. That should work. And OK, maybe with names it works. But in the general case, you can predict that's probably not going to do that well. A bigger problem with Z is that it's kind of ignoring Unicode, that there might be people like Gen uh, I hope I pronounced that right, down there at the end with a bunch of high Unicode characters at the end of his name. He's from Aldebar, and they use funny alphabets there. Um, that To be able to include that, we actually need to make that, uh, that last character we put in be something that's going to sort higher than anything else. And that turns out to be a little bit weird to do. I'll, I'll kind of show a, a bit of that later. So again, we start the prefix, the J-E-N. That's where we're going to start traversing the index from. And then at the end, we put a character that generally works is Unicode FFFE. And don't ask me why FFFF doesn't work. It has something to do with the details of the Unicode spec. So in the, in the conference app, the next question was, OK, but we want it to match both the first name and the last name. And are we going to have to make two views, like one that indexes the first name, one that indexes the last name, and then query both of them, and then you know, fold the results together? Well, no, you can actually do it by just emitting twice. It's not entirely intuitive when you first think about it, but once you realize it's like, OK, yeah, we can call emit as many times as we want. So we're going to create this view whose index contains this mixture of first and last names. But that's OK. We're just looking for any name, either first or last, that begins with that prefix. So to put things together, here like at the top, we've got our normalize function that's going to first lowercase the string and then remove diacritical marks. In the map function, we construct 
a value that we want to emit, which will be the first and last name, so that we can just get those values, since we, presumably we want to display those in the list. So we want to have those there in the value quickly, so we don't have to go and load the entire document into memory. Then we emit first the normalized first name and the value, and then we emit the normalized last name and the value. And to do the search, we just set the start key equal to the um, normalized search string, which is J-E-N in this case, and then the end key to be the same as the start key with that high character appended to it. So the next topic is compound keys, which is where you actually emit an array as the key. Uh, this is a really powerful thing. It's, it's quite useful because the, um, the view index is, of course, sorting everything by key. That's the purpose of the index. And it's pretty obvious that it's going to sort strings in kind of alphabetical order. Numbers are also sorted in numeric order. They come before strings. But you can have any JSON values in, th in the index as a key. So arrays, what happens with arrays? The arrays just get compared item by item, which is kind of what you'd expect for an array. So if the first two elements of the array match, it goes on to the second element and compares those until it finds one that's greater or until one of the arrays stops before the other one does. So what this does is if we, if we use arrays as the keys, it gives us this kind of hierarchical sort with the first element in the array being a primary key, the second element in the array being a secondary key, and so forth. So here's an example where we have documents that have both a year property and a title, like maybe they're movies. And we want a view that's going to index these with the, the year as the primary key, so it's going to be chronological, but we want it to be alphabetical by year. So we simply emit the array with the year as the first element and the title as the second element, and everything will end up being sorted properly. There's an example. Once we've done that, we can query it to get particular ranges. And since the keys in the index are arrays, that means that our keys that we specify as the start and end also have to be arrays to match. So if you want to find, let's say, all the movies from 2005, the start key would just be the array with 2005 in it. And the end key, this is actually sort of like the, uh, the string prefix matching problem, only we're dealing with arrays here, you know, arrays of objects instead of arrays of characters. So again, we want to take that and add an item onto the end of the array, which will sort after anything else. And uh, in this case, what we use is a little, there's an idiom where numbers come first in sort order, then strings, then arrays, and the thing that comes last in the sort order when indexing are JSON objects, that is, maps or dictionaries. And usually we don't use those in, as keys because they, they don't really work very well for keys for various reasons. But they're really handy as placeholders since they're going to sort after anything else. So in, for the end key there, we've just put in you know, a pair of curly braces denoting an empty object or dictionary which is going to sort after whatever else might be in there. So no matter what that second element of the index is, the second element of the key in the index, we know that the curly braces are going to come after it. So we'll, we'll include everything. So when you get the results back from a query, they're always sorted by key. Um, and the key pretty much needs to be the thing that you're trying to get a range of. The problem is that you may want to sort the elements for display into a different order. Like, for example, we were getting all of the movies from 2005, um, or say if we want all the ones from 2005 through 2014, they'd come back sorted in that order, but what if we wanted them displayed purely in alphabetical order? Or if we wanted them to be displayed by their star rating on Rotten Tomatoes or something like that? SQL obviously makes that pretty easy to do just by adding an order by clause onto your query. We don't have that natively with MapReduce. It's kind of a lower level mechanism. So you do need to sort the results manually. And this is actually what uh, the SQL query engine would do for you. If it found the index that it could use to get the data efficiently, 
but then you wanted the results ordered by a different criteria, and then the SQL engine will actually pull in all of the rows into memory, sort them in memory, and then hand them to you. So there's a bit of pseudocode there down at the bottom where we first run the query and collect all the objects into an array, and then we invoke some kind of hypothetical sort method that's going to sort the objects according to the criterion that we want. So grouping, this is kind of my favorite feature of uh, querying. It, you can do a lot of really interesting things with it. Uh, grouping is exposed by this property on a query called group level, which is a number, and it defaults to zero. What grouping does is it will take the entire range of output that the query produces, the range of rows, and it will coalesce together adjacent rows whose keys have prefixes that match. Uh, by prefixes, I mean array prefixes. It's pretty much assuming that your keys are going to be arrays. And the key that comes out that you see is going to be shortened down to that common prefix. So for every group of keys that start with a particular common prefix, you're going to get one row out in the result that will have that common prefix as its key. The value for that is going to be, since we're aggregating a bunch of data together, this is where the reduce function comes into play. So it's going to take all the rows that got collapsed together, run them through the reduce function, which is going to produce one output, and that output value is going to be the value that you see associated with that row. So as an example, here we've got the, uh, the list of famous movies again. And we're going to query it with a group level set to 1. So this means that we want to coalesce everything by the first element of the key, which in this case is the year. So what we're going to get out now is three rows, one of them with a key that's the array 2001, the next one with the key is 2005, the next one is the key 2010. So these are all the unique values of the first element of the key. The values that they map to, the bits after the arrow there, are what, what it got reduced to. So here I'm assuming that we had some kind of trivial reduce function that just took, to, took a bunch of rows and returned the count, returned the number of rows. So what we have here from this view is that we know that there were two movies released in 2001, two in 2005, one in 2010. There's fancier stuff you can do with grouping, too. This is one of my favorite examples. This is based on an app that I actually wrote just to play with when I was first getting my head around MapReduce and grouping. Uh, the first thing I did was that I wrote a, a script that went through my iTunes library, which there's actually an XML form of the iTunes library. It just read through that and wrote everything into a Couchbase Lite database. So there's kind of an example row there. So the, it has properties like album, artist, name being the track name, the total time, which is the time in seconds of that track, and then the track number in the album. There's actually a whole bunch more metadata that iTunes keeps, but this is the interesting stuff here. So what I had now is I had about like 10,000 of these documents in a database. And what I wanted to do was to display this kind of very typical three-column drill-down browser UI where I could list all of the artists in one column, uh, the albums by the selected artist in the next column, and then the tracks in that album in the next column in order, of course. And as a bonus, since iTunes will do this too, I wanted to at the bottom there show the total time. So first column shows the total time of all the stuff in the library. The second column shows the total time of all those albums, oh, total time of the selected album, sorry. And the third column shows the total time of the, um, yeah, the total time of that album in the third column. And we can actually do this pretty easily with grouping. So the first step is um, how to define the view itself. So the map function here is going to emit a compound key. And it's pretty much in that hierarchy order that we want to display the list in. So the first item in the key is the artist. Second is the album. Uh, the third is the track number, not the track name, because the artist and album art lists are going to be in alphabetical order, but we actually want the tracks to come out in track number order. So we're going to emit the track numbers so that they sort correctly. And then we'll put the name in there, the track name, as the fourth component of the key. And for the value, we're just going to put out the time of that track. 
Then for the reduce function, uh, since what we want to know about is total times, the reduce function just sums up the values, the input values. So the, since the value that we emitted for each row was the track time, summing those together is going to sum up the times of all the tracks that are being reduced together. So to do column one, we just set the group level to one, which is going to coalesce together by the first element of the key, which is the artist name. And there's a little bit of pseudocode there for something we might do to test this out, where we just loop over all of the things that come back in the query, printing the first item of the key and the value. So if you ran this, it would produce this list of um, all of the artists in the library in alphabetical order. And next to each one would be the total time of all of the songs by that artist. For column two, we're going to set the group level to two. And so this is going to aggregate together all of the unique artist, comma, album pairs in the keys. So we're going to get one item in the output for every album, basically. And the key is going to consist of artist, comma, album. Uh, for this query, we only, we're drilling down, so we only want to get the uh, results for the album, for the artist that was selected in the first column. So here, assuming we selected the artist Big Black, we're going to set that as an array as the start key, and then the same trick, appending that empty dictionary as the end key. So we're going to get all of the rows that begin with that prefix. And again, if we print this, this time printing the item with subscript one, the second item of the key, which is the album name, we're going to get an alphabetical listing of all the albums by that artist. Finally, for column three, uh, this time we're just going to turn off grouping entirely, setting the group level to the default value of zero, because this time what we want to look at are the actual individual tracks themselves. So we're, there's no grouping going on at all. And this, we're doing the same trick again for getting a range of array values from the keys, just this time we have a longer key. So we want all the values where artist is big black, album is atomizer, and then anything else coming after that. And since in our um, map function we were clever enough to emit the track number as the next item in the key, they're all going to get sorted by that. But we're just going to ignore that value here. So we're just in the sample query. We're going to print the track name and the value of it, which is going to be just the individual time of that track. So you can generalize this to going down to any depth. Uh, and it works with outline views as well as the kind of column browser view that I've got here. Uh, so it's quite a good way of taking this kind of hierarchical structured data and displaying it in a nice user-friendly way in your UI using grouping. So the last topic under querying is something that I call pseudo joins. It's just a word that I made up, so don't look for it anywhere else. But it solves this problem of the kind of things that you would typically reach for a join if you were doing them in SQL. And you can't do everything that you can do with joins using a single map reduce. Some, of, some complex things you may have to do by like running several queries and combining things together yourself. But you can actually do more stuff than you would at first think is possible. So the, the conceptual thing to, to realize here is that usually when you write a view, there's this kind of boilerplate where you know, you're, you're often using this type property in your documents to separate one type of doc from another, you know, which is sort of this alternative to having tables, where we've got you know, maybe like uh, songs are one type of document, videos are another type of document, audiobooks are a different type of document. And so very typically, what you're going to do in your, in your view is like, OK, this view is for indexing the videos. And so the first thing we're going to check is you know, if doc.type is not equal to video, then return. You know, we're only going to, to index stuff for this one document type. Well, if you don't do that, you can actually do stuff where you take data from different types of documents and combine them together into one index. And you can do, and using that, if you are careful about the keys you use so that you kind of order things together the right way, you can merge together results from multiple document types and thus get um, join type behavior. So here's an example. Uh, this is like some kind of simple blog uh, database 
where we have two types of documents. We've got a blog post, we've got a comment. Each of them, as you see, has a type property that uh, is set to post for the blog post, set to comment for the comment. Um, obviously, they all have IDs. All documents have IDs. And the other relevant bit here is that the comment has a property called post, which is the document ID of the post that the comment is on. And what we'd like to know about is we'd like to get a listing of all of the posts in the blog and how many comments each of them has. So this might be like the, for the home page of the blog or for the archive page where you want to see, like, you know, here are all the posts, here's how many comments. Now, how do we do that? So what we do is we construct a view that's going to intermingle the blog posts and the comments in a way that we can collect the stuff together properly. So what I'm showing here is the key here is going to be the blog post ID. Uh, so whether the document is a blog post itself or a comment, we're going to emit the ID of the blog post that is involved. Then for the post, we're going to emit the title, because we want to display that. And for the comment, we're just going to emit null for the value, which, because we don't really have anything else for the comment that we want to display. And it also helps us keep track of whether the, a particular row came from a blog post or a comment. So once we've got that, we just run this through our handy group feature. And it turns out you can use group level one without having to have arrays for keys. It's just going to say, OK, it's not an array, so I'll just use the entire key as the criterion for grouping. So what's going to come out in the, in the result of the query when we've set the group level to 1 is that all the items for a particular blog post get aggregated together because they all have the same key. So we're going to see that uh, the welcome post has no comments. The some news post has one comment, and the question post has four comments, because all the r rows for those got aggregated together. And the values in there that show the title and the comment involve a little bit of cleverness in the reduce function, which I'll show you on this slide. So here we've got the map. The map is pretty simple, but you'll see what it's doing is that it's using the document type as the the trigger in a switch and doing different things depending on which type of document it is. So for the blog post, we just emit the document's ID as the key and the title as the value. If it's a comment document, we emit the post property, which is the ID of the post that it came from as the key and null for a value. And that gives us what we saw on the previous slide, that intermingled listing of documents, of uh, blog posts and comments because they're all being sorted by the blog post ID. The reduce function here, what we want to do is, given this list, it's basically giving us a list of all the documents that have this, are associated with this blog post. We know that one of them is going to be the post itself, and it's going to have the title as the value. The other ones are going to be comments, and they're going to have null as the value. So if we look through that list and find the one that has a non-null value, that's going to be the title. So that's what that first line there does. I'm just assuming we have this sort of functional style first function that we pass a closure to. So then we return a value that consists of that title. And the number of comments is just the number of rows that got fed into the reduce function minus 1. So minus 1, why? Well, because the rows that we got in, we got one row corresponding to the blog post itself, and then the rest of them are the comments. So if we want to know how many comments there were, we have to ignore the blog post, so subtract 1. And that will give us exactly what we saw here, where the, um, the values that come out in the result that we see are this array with the title and the number of comments. So there are some upcoming uh, features in development for queries that make some of this stuff easier. And I'm going to talk about them in the second presentation that I'm giving at 5.10 on the future of Couchbase Lite. One of them is easy prefix matching, just that appending the magic Unicode character is such a hack that I just decided to get rid of it in the API. And just even if we have to do that internally, like we, you shouldn't have to worry about it. Custom sorting, where you can, uh, you can attach basically a sort descriptor to your query that says what 
properties of the output you want to sort by. Like maybe you want to sort by the value, or you want to sort by the second element of the key. Well, you can specify that. In memory filtering, this will let you Essentially, there will be, there's a property on the query which will be, whose type is a closure, returning a Boolean, so it's a predicate. And uh, as the index is being traversed, the, um, the index engine will call your closure on every row that it finds, and your closure can decide whether to return true or false. So this can let you do some, uh, use arbitrary criteria to filter out which rows appear in the results or not. And finally, there's this thing I'm calling a query planner, which is I'm still tinkering with, but it's sort of a halfway step between the pure MapReduce that we have now and uh, Nickel. I don't think that we're going to be able to have Nickel in like the next feature release of Couchbase Lite, just because the current Nickel implementation, that, which is still in development, is very much tuned for running on a server. It talks to Couchbase server APIs. It's written in Go, which is not a mobile-friendly language. So it's, I think it's still going to be a while before we can actually um, adapt Nickel to run mobile. But I've come up with some stuff that allows you to specify your queries in a higher level way that, if you squint hard, can kind of look like it was SQL. And it actually makes generating queries and, and indexing uh, a lot nicer. So all these things I'm going to talk about at 5.10 in my other session, which I hope you'll come to. But you don't get to use them yet, though. That's the problem. So conflict resolution, next major topic. Uh, Tron actually did a good job of talking about conflicts in his talk, which I, I don't know if you attended his introductory talk before. Uh, I'm going to repeat some of the same stuff, but it's the kind of thing that you probably want to see several times before it really sinks into your head. So hopefully that won't matter too much. So it, conflicts are really just different revisions of a document that have the same parent revision. Under the hood, Couchbase Lite is keeping a revision history of every document, which is important for syncing. It's a little bit like what Git or Subversion or other version control systems do, although not, not as fancy in some ways. Like you, should, you shouldn't mistake Couchbase Lite for a version control system, but it's using some of those same techniques, like generating multiple revisions of a document uh, and uh, assigning each of them a unique digest and keeping track of them as a tree. So if the tree branches, that's where you have a conflict. Suddenly, there's no longer an unambiguous answer to what is, this, uh, what is the value of this document. Well, we have two revisions that are sort of equal, have equal rights to be the winner. So from a more graphical perspective, here's something. We have a document. It's got some properties in it, the name and score properties. And so we we make a change to it. Here we've altered the name to capitalize it. And uh, on a different client at the same time, so the client there makes a different change. And in this case, it's editing the other property to increment the score. And at, at the time these changes happen, the clients don't know about each other. This is you could either look at it as a race condition, or you could look at it as sort of an inevitable side effect of uh, disconnected behavior. Maybe the two clients that did this were um, you know, on the subway, had Wi-Fi turned off, who knows what. But once they come back online, they sync together, and now everybody ends up in this state. So as far as the replicator is concerned, everything is fine. You know, it's synced. Everybody's got the same state of the world. It's just that everybody now has a state of the world where there's a branch here, and this document now has two different possible values. So you, you would probably like to uh, be able to resolve that somehow. So one fact is that if you're just working locally uh, in one, your one local database, it's almost impossible to create a conflict because uh, the local database will actually just return an error. Uh, if, if you pull a document into memory, make some changes to it, and then maybe the replicator in the background brought down a new update, and then you try to save it, you will actually get a conflict error when you try to save it. 
and to which you will like need to go back and maybe reload the document, make the changes again, try it again. The place that conflicts happen is that when replication is involved, because this is a distributed system, and you really cannot avoid conflicts in a distributed system. Um, because as in the example before, you can have multiple clients that can be making simultaneous or effectively simultaneous updates. The only way around this is to use some kind of a locking system, like some of the really early version control systems did this, where you could check out a document, you could check out a source file and you'd have a lock on it, and nobody could alter that until you checked it back in or released the lock. And it turned out everybody hated this because what inevitably happened was that somebody would lock the document and then go on vacation and then nobody could work on that document for two weeks until they came back. And the same thing happens in a system like this. Like, you know, you are in the middle of editing something on your phone, you walk down into the subway, and you, know, you still have the lock, so the server now prevents anybody else from editing it. It's just not feasible. You can't do it in a really distributed system. So instead, you have to have the system where, like, yes, it's optimistic concurrency. We let anybody edit the document, and then we have to deal with the consequences, which are these possible conflicts. So as I explained, the conflict is really just a branch in the revision tree. And so the job of the app now in dealing with conflicts is to find where this occurs and then do something about it. So detecting, resolving. If you have a document already, a document object in Couchbase Lite, it's really easy to check. You just, um, there's a property on it called conflicting revisions or get conflicting revisions in the Java syntax. And this will return to you all of the currently active revision objects of that document. And in the typical case where there is no conflict, there's going to be one revision, which is just the one that has the properties of the document in it. If that thing comes back with two or more uh, revisions in the array, you know you're looking at a conflict. And you've also now gotten the different versions that you're going to need in order to do the merge. If you want to know about the entire database, like you don't want to iterate over every single document in the database and call get conflicting revisions, which is going to be slow, you can actually run a query to do this more efficiently. Uh, you do an all documents query, and uh, that type of query has a mode property that you can set. And there's a special mode called only conflicts in which it's not going to return all documents. It's actually going to completely lie about the name. It's just going to return you the documents that have conflicts. And there's some pseudocode there to do it. You just create an all documents query, set its mode to only conflicts, run the query, and all the rows that you get back are going to be the rows that are the documents that are conflicted. You can even make a live query based on that and have like continuous up-to-date information on whether there are conflicts. And there's always overhead to running a live query because you're doing that query every time the document changes. So it may or may not be worthwhile to you. But depending on what kind of a view you have and how likely conflicts are, it might be useful. So now that you know about the conflict, how do you resolve it? The first step is to determine what the new value of the document should be, that kind of merged set of properties. And we deliberately don't have any default way of doing this because it's very, very application specific. And you can imagine sort of generic mechanisms for doing it where we just look at every property in the JSON, figure out which one changed, and then stuff the changed values in. But that can actually produce really bad results. It can like, produce inconsistent or bad data in some application cases. And then, of course, there's always the cases where you're looking at something like text. And nobody but the user can look at that text and figure out how to edit it to merge all the different conflicts together, like you know, if you're editing wiki documents. So we leave that up to the app. But at least once you've gotten the conflicting revisions, you can now um, you have all the information that you need in order to merge stuff together. So now what you do then is you take your new fancy merged together document and you update. You, you save that as the over one of the conflicting revisions, making a new child of it. And the other revision or revisions you delete, um, which remember, deletion doesn't really delete. It adds a new revision that's flagged as being a deletion. It's called a tombstone. And uh, going back to our graphical example here, so here we are in the conflict state. 
So we figured out the merge. Here I just did the obvious thing of taking the two changes and putting them together. We saved that over the, uh, the winning revision. And then the other one we just delete. So we end up with this um, empty revision here that just has this metadata flag underscore deleted whose value is true. And the document is now in a state where there's an unambiguous value um, because the deleted revision will be ignored. So the, that revision at the top is now the value of the document. So here's some pseudocode showing that whole uh, algorithm. First, we call some application to find my merge revisions to determine the actual JSON value that we were going to put in the document. We then find out what the current revision of the document is, and then we just loop over all the conflicting revisions. If the one we're, ha if the one we're handling now is the current revision, then we save the, the new document value over it. Otherwise, we flag the new revision as a deletion, and then we save it. A couple of interesting facts about conflict resolution. Um, typically, it's done on the client just because it often involves user interaction. Um, but any, any client can do it. And as soon as one client resolves the conflict, that resolution involves new revisions that are going to get synced to everybody else. So they've effectively resolved it for everybody in the system. It's possible to do resolution on the server. The, the basic approach is the same. It's just that you're using sync gateway APIs instead of couch-based light APIs to do the work. You might also ask, like, what, so what happens if two clients now like simultaneously go in and, and resolve the conflict? If they made exactly the same resolution, so in, in like the automated case where you, you didn't have user intervention, then everybody who tries to resolve it is probably going to end up with the same result because they're following the same algorithm. So that's great. They all ended up with the same thing. There are no conflicts. Um, it just works. On the other hand, if like, there was user interaction involved, so they're editing a wiki page or something like that, and they didn't have do exactly the same thing, well, all that happens is that you've got a new conflict. So the document is now in conflict again just in, with these new resolved things. And then we get to do the same thing again, where it'll get flagged, and somebody will say, oh, look, you know, somebody else edited it too, and they'll go and fix it up. And if that goes on three or four times, then those people might want to phone each other up and tell each other to stop resolving the conflict. So I just have a couple minutes left. Uh, I've got some performance tips. Uh, forgive me if I go through these too fast, but might be time for Q&A. So transactions, um, if you're going to be updating multiple documents at once, you should always wrap those in an in-transaction block as shown in the sample code. The reason for this is that SQLite, um, if you issue a single update in SQLite, that's a transaction. And every transaction has a fair amount of overhead at the end when it makes sure that it's written everything durably to disk. And that can often be in like up to 100 milliseconds or so. So if you're updating a bunch of documents without wrapping them in a transaction, then you've just created a whole bunch of individual transactions, and the overhead for the disk I.O. there is going to be significant. So th this helps a lot, especially if you're like importing data from somewhere else and you want to add thousands of documents. You have to do this in a single transaction. With MapReduce, the map function can be a bottleneck, so make sure you're not doing anything expensive there. Uh, one particular thing that keeps happening is Parsing dates is surprisingly slow. Um, there's a lot of weird logic around just the, the parsing and the different calendar formats and so on. So um, if you can try to just use the date string without having to parse it, it turns out that the typical JSON date format can be sorted in order just as a string without having to convert it into anything else. And if you're emitting a value, don't put a huge amount of stuff into the value. Like in particular, don't emit the entire document as the value, because that value has to get uh, encoded in JSON, stored in the database, read back out, expanded back into objects. I, I've, I've seen cases where that turned out to be a significant bottleneck, especially as the amount of data in there grows really large. Also, um, the reduce operation in Couchbase Lite is not as fast as on Couchbase Server for some very technical details having to do with the fact that 
on Couchbase server, they own the B tree and they can store intermediate data inside of the B tree nodes. We don't own SQLite and we didn't want to mess with the internals of SQLite, so we don't do that. So in our case, the reduce function will have O of N performance. So l really large reduces may get slow. Um, no one has actually run into this yet, to my knowledge, but it's waiting out there to happen. Indexing is incremental. So every time you query, it's going to go and call your map function on every document that's been updated or created since the last time that view was queried. So if only a couple documents have changed, that's not a big deal. It's going to be quick. But there, there's particularly a case where um, you've done your first sync and just downloaded 1,000 documents into the database, and then you want to run a query. And that's going to take a while, because there's 1,000 or 10,000 or whoever knows how many documents that have to get run through that map function and added to the index. So that can increase the latency of having that um, UI appear after the sync. The workaround for that is to just periodically issue a query, like some kind of a no-op query maybe with an empty, you know, with, where the start key and end key are the same, or the, number of, the limit number of rows is one, or something like that. You're really issuing the query just for the purpose of updating the view index. Uh, you can actually even use a live query for this, because live queries have the effect of rerunning the query every time the database changes. This is not going to decrease the total amount of time that your you know, sync plus display the UI takes, but it kind of rearranges the time so that uh, your, you don't have this big lit pause between the time the sync finishes and the, dis and the display updates, which that can make your application seem more responsive in some cases. And let's see, I'm almost out of time. Yeah, in, in a query, when you have a query row and you access the document property to get the document out of it, it actually is going to go and fetch the document out of the database at that moment. So it's really nice if you can avoid that. And that's what the value is for that you emitted in your map function. The value comes along with the query row. So every property you get out of the value is effectively free at the time that you're using the query results. So what you want to do is, like in a view where you're going to display the first and last name of the contact, emit the first and last name as the value. And then you have them right there already when you're doing your display. Whereas if you fetch the document and then get the first and last name out of the document, you've just inserted a database hit in there for every row of the query that you're going to display. And the performance of that might be worse. Um, live query, it, it has overhead, as I said, because it has to uh, run the query again every time the database changes. So don't keep, a don't keep a lot of live queries running if you don't need to. And I'll skip the compaction one. And I uh, hope we have some time left for Q&A if anybody's got questions. Yes, question. Uh, the APIs on the server are different, so it's not as, it doesn't look as simple on the server, right? You're going to get the rows back as a big JSON array, and then you're actually going to have to get, pull the document ID out of there and send another request to the database to get it back. So you're very aware of what you're doing if you do that on the server side. Whereas in Couchbase Lite, you're just doing, you know, row dot document dot first name. And it sort of hides the fact that there is a database fetch going on in there. Yeah. So this is a perch, perch thing. So if I perch it from my local mobile, then how do I bring it back? Yeah, that is, purge is sort of a weird operation. And some people, especially in the CouchDB world, say, you shouldn't be using purge. It, that's problematic right now. There is some stuff that, is, that we're working on for future releases that's going to make that more transparent. So if you come to the other talk I'm giving at 5.10, I'm going to talk a bit more about some things that will make that work more cleanly. It's hard to see back there. Anybody else? Wiggle your hands around if you have a question. Oh, yeah.
Yeah, so the question's about what kind of a load um, couch-based light is going to place on the app, especially with things like battery drain. The significant factor there has to do with uh, the, the radio. And if you run a continuous replication, that is going, a continuous pull replication is going to keep a socket open to the server so that the server can send these push events to the client telling it when there are new, new changes. And keeping that socket open also keeps the radio open, like the, the Wi-Fi or the, the cellular radio, which is a non-trivial amount of battery drain. Now, it's only doing this while your app is active in the foreground. When you put your app in the background, the replications are going to pause and that socket gets closed. But that, that can be a factor, and you can work around that by um, either using non-continuous replications and just periodically starting one, or there's actually a property on the replication um, at the poll interval. So you can, you can set the replication to, instead of continuously having a socket open, to just call into the server every you know, five minutes, maybe, and check for new data. And that will be more conservative with battery life because that means that 99% of the time it does not have an open, it's not using the network. It just means that there's going to be greater latency for receiving documents. So that's a trade-off that you need to make. Uh, you can also do some stuff using push replications, although that gets rather platform specific. But both iOS and Android um, will allow the server to contact a push notification server that can then notify the device that there's new data. OK, I don't see any other hands. But, oh, yeah. Sorry, what was that? Can I pull the server to what? Um, th that's getting kind of platform specific. I can't speak for Android because I don't develop for that platform. On iOS, you really can't do that sort of thing in the background. The OS is just not going to let you. So push notifications are, are going to be a, a requirement there. But there is a really great mode in iOS 7 and up where the app can receive a push notification and wake up in the background without displaying a notification or coming to the front. And it gets a minute or two to run in the background, and it can then start the replication and fetch data. So that way, when the user next brings the app up, it will have the new data already. So that can do a lot of what you're, what you're asking for. All right. Thanks a lot. <laughs>